The present moment is the only place where creation happens. Your thoughts, words, and deeds are creative, and, and specifically what we're thinking about our present moment. Those people who are saying, this is how things are, this is how things are, when they shift their perspective to being a creator of their experience, they go, this is how things have been, but now I'm doing this. And they can literally shift out of that, that cycle of fear and anxiety and shift into a new direction and a new outcome. Hello and welcome to Passion Harvest. I am Louisa, your host. Thank you so much for joining me wherever you are in the world right now. Our guest today is John Davis. We are always being guided. John was raised a Catholic and did not believe in reincarnation until he experienced Jesus during a profound past life regression. John is an intuitive healer and has some wonderful teachings on his YouTube channel, John of New. This is his story and this is his passion. John, welcome back to Passion Harvest. Oh, Louisa, it's always a pleasure to be here with you. I just enjoy your company so much. I just, I mean, I love chatting with you. I'd um, like to just briefly start with your your reincarnation and meeting Jesus, if you don't mind sharing that with the audience. Oh, not not at all, not at all. I uh, I <laughs> I had uh, nineteen psychics out of the blue tell me about my my past life as John the Beloved Apostle, and as a as a Catholic boy, I. I really fought against it hard. I did not want to want to go down that route and be the guy who thought he was an apostle in a past life and all that kind of thing. And one day I said, uh, "Oh, please just give me a sign that that is, you know, that's not a psychic telling me this." And a buddy handed me a book and it was a book called Edgar Casey on the Millennium. And I opened it up and <laughs> page 32, John the Beloved would again be named John. So I, I ran off and I got my regression. And when I got my regression, I I had an experience which was very unique for, for most regression people. Um, my regression was very visceral. It was like I was standing there on the beach. And the conversation I was having with the regressionist was the thoughts in my head. So it was like my consciousness swapped. And I go over to the crowd. And as I get there, I, I kind of push my way into the crowd. I could start to feel this person's presence this person in the middle of the crowd, I start to feel it. And you, you hear me on my regression start to gasp and start to, you know, pant a little bit because it's like, oh my God, you can feel his presence. And then as I come through, uh, the guy that I call Jeshua Ben Joseph was standing there. And most people know him as Jesus, but he looks at me and it was, it was the strangest thing. He looked at me like he'd known me his whole life. And he walked over and he raised his hand up and he put it on my chest. And I had what most people would call either a near-death experience or a Kundalini rising. I had a full oneness experience in the white expanse, feeling the oneness of everything and uh, no fear, no anxiety, just pure, pure love. And the regressionist got confused and she says, are, are you with him or are you him? And my response was, I'm within him. And I had this massive experience of just being at one with 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 Jeshua and Joseph and everybody else and everything, everything all at once. And then she says, what's the next most important thing? And the next most important thing was falling back into my fears and my anxieties and my separation. And I came to the realization that a lot of this physical world is about coming down into this expression so that we can feel that separation, so that we can come to know that love of God or consciousness, yada, yada, whatever you call it. Um, more fully, because you can't know anything without knowing the opposite of some form. I, I liken it to being, my friend Kim Carey, she she uh, she says, it's like being in a white room with a white table and a white chair, and you're pure white, and you don't know what white looks like, because you have nothing to compare it to until you see red. And so that's kind of what I was experiencing without coming down into the fears and the anxieties of the world and feeling that separation, then I couldn't have that experience. And I remembered so much about that life, but a lot of the interesting things that was really interesting was interesting things in good English <laughs> um, uh, was the um, a lot of a lot of uh, people who get regressed like I did, especially ones who get very visceral reactions, very visceral expressions, uh, will have a channel left open, 
And so now what happens, ever since 1999, somebody will say something that will trigger a new visceral memory. And I'll, I've been having these ongoing memories pop in uh, for years and years and years. But the the biggest thing that I, I like to say about my past life regressions is it really doesn't matter who anybody was. It only matters who you are in the present moment, in the now, because it is the only moment you're conscious. You can get those past life memories, but those memories are just information to work from. What are you doing with the information is what I like to say. We we are all love. We come from love. Why is it that we forget in our humanness? Well, and, and that is that is exactly it. We, we, we forget. We come down through this veil. You know, in Sufism, they say that um, God is on one side of a veil and we're on the other side of the veil. And our life is a struggle against the veil and the veil is our fear. And I really do think it is. It's we come down to this physical place to to have our experience in that that fear place and feeling that separation so we can find our way back and 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 express the source, the oneness of all more fully. You know, and most people, they hear these very esoteric topics and these very esoteric ways of talking about it. And I, I make it very practical because for me, I, when, I, when I walk out my door and I go to the grocery store, before I go in there, I, I exhale, I let go of my fears, I feel that loving expression, and I walk through a grocery store. And I watch people turn and smile at me, and I, I, you know, people start joking with me, and kids play with me, and uh, it's just loving the world, I'm getting the love in return. And so I think we're here literally to feel that separation so that we can find that dichotomy and find our way back to the source. I speak to so many people at the clients and we get so caught up in our fear. We make it so real. And, and, and so many of us, perhaps someone in the audience who's listening to this is suffering um, yeah. or in a state of fear, whatever it might be, or in a cycle of negativity. What's your advice to get out of it? Well, the first thing I'd say is exhale. <laughs> um, most people forget to breathe. You know, when we get in, when we get in a fear state, the first thing someone says is, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And, you know, we have a chronic uh, issue right now with asthma and all kinds of breathing disorders in, in the world. But we know that when a person is, is in fear, the first thing their body does on a primal level is to store air. And if you're, to give you an example, if you're a parent and you've had, you have children, you remember when they're toddlers and they're walking across the living room, they slip, they fall, they almost hit their head on the coffee table. And the first thing you did was go, <gasps> and you gasp for air, right? Well, the reason you gasp for air is because you're filling your lungs up so you can run fast. It's part of the primal response. Now, on the same level, actors who are on Broadway, if they forget their lines on stage and in front of a thousand people, they literally are trained to exhale, relax all their muscles, and all their lines come rushing right back into their heads. They literally shut off that fear response. I had a friend of mine who suffers from severe anxiety attacks, and He's, he's heard me talk for years, but he hasn't always put what, what I said into practice, which is how your friends treat you sometimes, right? <laughs> um, but uh, he called me up a few weeks back. And he says, John, I wanted to thank you. I said, why? He says, he says I was having a severe anxiety attack, and I, I thought of you just saying exhale. Just exhale. He says, and I, so I stopped, and I just exhaled. He says, and my anxiety attack stopped. I said, because all anxiety is based upon fear. And that fear itself is, is the reactive nature. Now, if you think about what fear really is, fear is an emotional reaction to a future event that may or may not happen with us focused on some negative outcome. So all fear depends on a negative focus. And so if you were focused on a positive outcome, you wouldn't be afraid at all. So it's a matter of, first of all, releasing that fear and, 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 also labeling it as a fear because um, in, in Star Wars, uh, Yoda says, named must your fears be before banish it you can. Well, when you label your fear as a fear, what you're doing is you're, you're getting outside of fear because most people are in fear when they have that response. But when they label it as a fear, it suddenly becomes an external and they can control it. So they can go, oh, it's just fear. I am doing something different. And they can make that conscious choice. But it's a matter of first exhaling and releasing the, the primal response so the body can then think and be cognitive again.
And it's it's, it's so simple. We intellectually know that, but when people are in a state of fear, it, it, it's justified in every way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And rationalized. And <laughs> ab- absolutely. And, and literally justified, like you said. People will justify their issues. You know, I find that most people will go through life um, kind of in you know, a various state of, of victim mode, you know. And I say that interesting because some people are very much in the victim mode. Some people are just like, well, this is how things are because that happened. And the problem is they go, this is how things are. This is how things are. This is how things are. And they keep saying it over and over again because that's their present moment focus. And, you know, the, the present moment is the only place where creation happens. Your thoughts, words, and deeds are creative. You know, the, the Buddha said, what, what you think you become, you create your world. And Krishna said, you are the culmination of your thought. And the Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. Shakespeare said, there's nothing good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. And so we have to, our thoughts are the things we need to, to really pay attention to. And, and specifically what we're thinking about our present moment. Those people who are saying, this is how things are, this is how things are. When they shift their perspective to being a creator of their experience, they go, this is how things have been but now I'm doing this and they can literally shift out of that, that cycle of fear and anxiety and shift into a new direction and a new outcome. Because the reality of it is, is that, you know, the, if I go to a Bible uh, quote, whatever you ask in God's name is granted. If you have faith, the well, faith is the belief, right? But Moses said, God's name is I am. Not I will be, not I was, very present moment. So I am struggling is asking for struggle. So your focus is on struggle so you get struggle. And I love what you said earlier about it being so simple. In my regression, my first regression actually, I literally said under hypnosis, it's so simple we have a hard time comprehending it. And that that simplicity is what makes it makes it tough for us to find because we all want a structure, you know. When you look at um, the original story of Adam and Eve, the moral of that story is really an interesting story because, and, and I think of it as mythology, but they ate from the tree of knowledge that got kicked out of paradise. They got in their heads and out of their hearts, out of their feelings. And, you know, if you look at it in, the, in modern metaphysical physical terminology, the masculine and the feminine, the feeling heart and the thinking brain, and it's like they get down all these rabbit holes of how it's got to be and what are the rules, what are the methods, what are the modalities, what are the techniques. But I, I, I will say that all the big spiritual experiences that have happened to me in my life have came without any of those things. They've just, I've relaxed into it, I've, I've let go and I've exhaled and things have happened. And I think it's a matter of the more simple we can make our, our life, the, the quicker we come back to the source, come back to that loving expression. I, th- I really truly believe that uh, this is a trip we have to unpack for. Mm-hmm. Gosh, you're just such a bundle of joy. You make me smile. But <laughs> <laughs> it, essentially, well, our thoughts create our reality. Yeah, yeah. And what's what's really interesting is is when you step into the concept of controlling your thoughts. I'll give you a really interesting. And very simple example, you know, I was an actor for a lot of years. And uh, when actors get together, there's a couple of conversations they have. And <laughs> one of the conversations that they repeatedly have is, let's talk about overrated actors. Right? <laughs> and um, so I was sitting there one day and, I, and we were talking about actors we thought were overrated. And I was like, I can't remember that guy's name. I can't remember that guy's name. What's his name? And then I realized I was saying I can't. And I stopped and said, no, 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 I am remembering Sean Penn. And it was, it was that, sh- that quick shift of my belief that I can't and the belief that I am. And when I shifted to that, that simplicity of it. Now, I, I tell stories to my clients all day long when I'm, I'm helping them break out of their own cycles. But I tell them stories of mani- manifestations I've done in my life. And I've done the smallest little tiny things I've manifested into my life into gigantic things. And to give an example, um, on September 8th, 2001, I was performing a comedy sword fighting show at a Renaissance Festival. And that morning I got up and I said, I really would like to travel the world. 
So I actually put out a, a, an intention, and I put it out in a very present moment prayer style. My mom was Catholic, so I still use the, the kind of the prayer style. So I said, thank you, God, for the world travel I am receiving. Amen. Now, amen means so be it. I mean, right here, right now, it's done. And when you thank for something, it's because you believe you're receiving it. And then I said, I am, God's name, present moment statement, not I will be, not I was, receiving a present moment active motion. It's coming into my experience. And a lot of people will say, want, need, hope, try, wish, and can't. None of those are active. Receiving, creating, enjoying. So here's what happened that day. I put that prayer out in the morning. I finished a comedy show that afternoon. I was walking off stage. Two guys walked up to me. They said, hey, we've been watching your show for a really long time. How would you like to do USO shows? Now, for you guys in Europe, the, the USO is, is the organization that sends entertainment to the military overseas. And so we'd love to. So they said, well, get us your marketing packet and we'll, we'll make this happen. So Monday, I went to the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and I dropped off my marketing kit. Tuesday morning was September 11th. And the planes hit the Pentagon, the planes hit the World Trade Center. And all that stuff. Three weeks later, they called me up to say, how soon can you go? I said, go as soon as you want us to go. We are there. So from November to February of that year, I went to Iceland, England, Norway, Germany, Belgium, and Holland. And now I'm with the USO, I went to 16 countries. But during the same time, I had an author call me up and say, hey, we've read some things about the reincarnation of John that we in some prophetic works, and we, we'd like to take you to Egypt. So they took me to Egypt for a month. Then they took me to Peru for a month. Then they took me to uh, uh, Israel, Greece, and Jordan. And now I've been to over 30 countries in the world, and I didn't pay to go to any of them. I got paid to go to all of them. I, I love that. And, and just to recap or tips for the audience. So when we're talking about manifestation, it's not, I want this. It's almost as it has happened. Is that right. correct? Yeah. yeah, as if it's coming into the experience. You know, in... In the Bible, the first miracle is the water and the wine. And <laughs> I'm going to kind of play with the story a little bit. You know, mom comes over to Jay and she says, hey, they're out of wine. He says, mom, it's not time yet. Right. And he turns to the servants. He says, fill those jugs with water. Place the jugs over there. And then he gets up and walks over and there's wine. Right. But the first thing he said was, it's not time yet. He realizes that when he's manifesting something into his experience, it's coming into his experience. So it's not time for it to be wine yet, but it's coming into his experience. But then he put thought, word, and deed. The deed was the key here. He says, put water in those jugs. He, had, he took a physical action with the same belief. And putting th all thoughts, words, and deeds into action, it became wine. And so people will say, I want you know, I am wanting. Well, God's name is I am, and whatever you ask in God's name is granted. I am wanting. God's going to give you want. Need, hope, try, all the same. I am receiving. I am creating. I am enjoying. I am expressing. I am being surrounded by. And so many people I, who are, especially in the spiritual and metaphysical world, they believe that struggle equals growth. And I am struggling. will give them struggle for the rest of their life. I, I, I live my life as if it's a fun game and I, I joyfully, what do I want today? You know, right. <laughs> and I just, so I'm sitting in a house right now, Louisa, that I made a list of what I wanted in a house. And I was like, okay, I want three bedrooms. I want a mother-in-law suite for my, my, my then wife's aunt, you know, uh, we're no longer together, but, um, so we had three bedrooms, mother-in-law suite, a gigantic studio for my wife to have a sewing room because she was a costumer. I said, I need a big garage so I can have a workshop. I need a, at least two acres with woods and a creek because I want to go sit next to the creek and meditate. All right. So this is my, my list that I want in the house. Thank you, God, for the house that I, that I am receiving just like this. Amen. Right. So a couple months later, I got invited to a Christmas party and I came to a friend's house and I walked in. And I was like, oh my gosh, this house has everything. And I say to her, I say, is there a creek in the woods out back? She says, oh, yeah, there's a creek. And there's also like a little platform for, for like sitting on back there too, right? <laughs> right? And I said, wow, I, I love your house. She says, really? I'm really over it. And I'm currently sitting in that house right now as we talk. 
I do, I love that. That's such a beautiful story. So it's not I'm looking for, I'm waiting for my house. No. It's imagined. It's there. You're just in some essence aligning with it. Yeah, it's it's coming into my experience, and I know, and I believe it. You know, mm. it says whatever you ask in God's name is granted if you have faith. He also says, when you pray, believe you shall receive, and you shall. And then the the better one is. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can ask a mountain to move and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And that's how I live my life now. I live my life as if nothing's impossible for me. And as well, even right now, well, I told you I'm living in this house now. Well, my wife and I are no longer together. So I decided that I and my and my son, my beautiful son, is now in college. So I moved to Ohio to be with my son when he was two. And now he's in college and doing that. And so my plan is to move back to the beach because I'm originally from the beach. I don't have a house down there yet. Not even sure how I'm going to finance that yet, but I'm packing my house as we speak. My house is being purged and broken down because <laughs> I am, I am moving to the beach. You actually already <laughs> have moved. It's just, right. <laughs> exactly. You're just catching I, I, up to the physicality. Exactly. I, I, and that's, that's another thing I said, wanting, needing, hoping and trying another one that, that is that, kind of messes people up is how right now, how is this going to happen well what is the present moment belief about how that it's not right i gave myself permission a long time ago to say to see learn how after the fact and and i i, I think it's great because I, i'm like wow that's so amazing how that happened let me tell you another quick just manifestation yeah story. many years ago i was and I mean, many is almost, almost, gosh, almost 20 years. Well, over 20 years now I was out doing my work because of my past life stuff. And I was invited to go speak at the, at the association for research and enlightenment. Now, for those guys who don't know what that is, that's basically the Edgar Casey Institute. That's the, the main, main campus in Virginia beach. It's where Edgar Casey's house was. And so I was really excited to go speak at this place. So I was like, okay, but I had a big chip in my front tooth. And I was like, well, I don't want to go speak at the Edgar Casey place in Virginia Beach with a big chip in my front tooth. Thank you, God, for the perfect tooth I am receiving. Amen. I ordered a sandwich and it came to the house and I turned my television on to watch the news and I grabbed my sandwich and I bit into my sandwich and the tooth broke the rest of the way off. Now, most people at this point would say, well, that didn't work. What I said was cool. I wonder where this is leading me because I knew that I, I believe that I get what I ask for. So when the tooth broke off, it had to be part of the manifestation, had to be part of it. Well, a few hours later, I got a call from a lady who was the entertainment director of the Florida Renaissance Festival. And I had worked for her the year before doing a bunch of uh, script writing and choreography. She says, John, how are you? I said, well, Carol, honestly, my tooth just broke off. She says, that's really weird that you would say that to me today. I said, why? She says, I just became the president of rescue. I said, what's rescue? She says, you don't know what rescue is? I said, never heard of it in my life. She says, rescue is an organization that helps Renaissance Festival entertainers get medical and dental work done for free. Now, I was a Renaissance Festival That's amazing. For, amazing. <laughs> But long to make this long story short, she she uh, overnighted me a check for three thousand dollars. I got my teeth fixed. Wow! Yeah, it's, um, that I love that story. So I'm just thinking, you know, people like things in steps: one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, but yeah. people often say when you're manifesting, and I understand you have to feel it and you believe it to be true. Some people say you need to do it every day, once a week. Is there sort of frequency with which you need to think about those things? Well, it, it, it's interesting you ask that question because you're, you're kind of describing affirmations, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not a big believer in affirmations because of the, the definition of the word affirmation. Because the word means I am shoring something up I have no confidence in. Right. Because if you, if you need to affirm it, why? You know, I actually treat my manifestations like an Amazon order. I put my order in. I don't try to order it the next day or the next day after that. I just know it's going to show up on my doorstep, right? So I think of my, my, my world as a world of declarations. 
I declare it. I don't have a modality or method or technique after declaring it, except for believing it. And my belief goes fully into my thoughts, words, and deeds. I start doing things in alignment with my manifestation. And <clears throat> I told you the story of the tooth, but the, you, that happened in, in hours, right? I had another time I was, I was short of rent, and I said, thank you, God, for the unexpected income I am receiving. And I walked out my front door, and there was an envelope on the ground, and I opened it up, and there was a $400 check in it from a, as a refund from a doctor, which never happens, right? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he actually sent me uh, two-thirds of the money back from a procedure I had done. And I was like, boy, that is, that is never heard of. You're not going to ask why. You'll just say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what's cool about it was, was that what I asked for, I asked for unexpected income. Mm -hmm. And that was, it could not have come any more unexpectedly. And I, I love the analogy of the Amazon order. Why you don't need to do it every day. It's just, you, right. it's coming. Well, and, see, and, and, you know, that comes back to the psychology of, of cognitive dissonance. Because people will say things and, and not believe them. You know, people will go to church and pray for the same thing over and over again, asking for an external God to give them something. Whereas in reality, you're a co-creator with God. You know, you are the inspiration. God is the paint, the paintbrush, and the canvas. Together, you create the picture. But as it says in the Bible, you have to ask. Ask and it is given. So you have to be the one who actually puts out what you're, what you're, what you're getting, right? And God gives you exactly what you ever, whatever you ask for. And the way we ask, this is where most people get confused. The way we ask is not with our words. It's with our belief. So our words are in unison with our belief. So um, Shakespeare said, words without thoughts never to heaven go. And if you think about that, they don't they don't go to the source if you don't if you don't believe it because it's, because it's the belief that goes to the source. So it's a matter of figuring out what you believe and going, okay, I'm not doing that anymore. I am doing this. Right. It's it's like someone once said to me, well, you can say I love you in a hundred different ways. It means something each time with the intention right. behind it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And it is the intention behind it. I, I've known so many people who. Are, are very much into sarcasm, the comedy of sarcasm. And I'm not a fan of sarcasm because most sarcasm has an intention behind it that's not kind. You know, I think it, most of it is about knocking someone down as opposed to lifting someone up. So I, I, I am very much into the concept of, of intention. And when I manifest something, I'm intending it into, into being. I know it's going to happen. Knowing it, yes. Yeah. But, and John, I have to say, you're an incredibly disciplined guy. we spoke before the interview and recently you've done and you do it every year a 40 day fast yeah i am yeah. so i want to do that i just don't have the discipline i'm so <laughs> impressed well well louisa let's be honest you probably don't have the amount of weight on your body that i do <laughs> it's not an, it's not necessarily for weight it's just right, right. cleansing and no it and, totally is a cleansing for me as well how do you do it <laughs> So I have an, an, an easy technique for getting into, into, uh, into a fast. And the way it is, is, is our body is constantly running off of either carbohydrates or proteins, and specifically glucose or ketones. And if you can reduce the need for the glucose, your body stops having cravings. And so what I do is a week before I do a, a fast is I take all carbohydrate out of my body and I eat nothing but protein the week before. And I also knock it down to one meal a day. What's cool about that is when you drop into all protein for one meal a day, you aren't hungry ever. So you have this experience of just not being hungry because you're, the reason you get the hunger pains is because your body's crying out for more glucose. And so by going over to the ketone and dropping your body into ketosis, you, you lose hunger, you lose um, uh, the cravings for things, and what happens is you're down to one meal a day. So you've already reduced your meals down to one a day. And so you're already on the way there. Then, then maybe like a day or so before you start a full fast, take a day off and just not have your one meal. And then on the day, first day of your fast, just go have a meal. And then your second day of the fast, you'll be like, mentally, I want to have, I want to have food. But you're physically not hungry because you because you've broken the cycle of the glucose. So 
I want to have food. I want to have food. So you have to get over the past. So the way I do, what I do is I, I give myself a list of things to do during my fast before I even get into a fast. You know, projects I want to con- complete while I'm doing the fast. Because you're going to find that during the fast, you're suddenly going to have extra hours in the day, the time that you're normally preparing food or eating food. So you're suddenly going to have a whole bunch of extra time. And with that extra time, you can get so much done. And because you're now running off of ketones, your brain is actually clearer. So my my 40-day fast is the most productive time of my year. I get so much more done. I write on my books and I and I do more videos and I, I just work on more and more things because I have the time to do it and my and I'm clear headed. And then, you know, you go on and go on and go on. And eventually your mind will catch on to the fact that you're coming up to the day 40. And then in the, the last few days before day 40, you'll start to have mental hunger pains you'll start to go okay i'm really ready for this thing to end right but it's it's not really about the food it's more it's more about the you know that it's coming so it's going to happen so you go there and i would not suggest that anybody anybody go for 40 days first right out the bat you know try three days try seven days you know try 21 days you know build out to it i do 40 but i've been doing it for years and I do it, you know, every year in the month of March into April usually is my my 40 day time. And but, yeah, start small and think about it scientifically. Get the glucose out of the system so that your body isn't craving glucose. Well, I'm still incredibly impressed, really, uh, well, really impressed. <laughs> I know you awesome. do also have a few videos on your YouTube channel, but where's the best place for people to find you, John? Uh, honestly, the, I have a, a website called johnofnew.com. Uh, on my YouTube channel, I have two YouTube channels. I have one called Level Up Spirit, which is uh, only started a month ago. It's already got 2,500 subscribers. It's already monetized. It, would, it monetized in two and a half weeks. But my John of New channel has a thousand videos on there. Um, it's only a year and a half old, too. So it tells you how prolific I was during my fast. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, find me on the, either one of those channels, and you'll. That's the way. The best way to contact me is commenting on videos. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, Luisa, I, I I don't know if, if you're okay with this. I'd like to offer your your listeners um, a fifty dollar discount on, on my private sessions if they're interested. Of course, of course, and I will I will leave a link to your website in the show notes okay. as well. Well, and and I'll make sure you get the special link that they have to use to get that fifty dollar okay, discount. That, that, That'd be wonderful. Thank you so much. John, I've I've loved having you on Passion Harvest. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the Passion Harvest audience? Well, yeah, you know what I really would. What I'd like to say is that that you are powerful, you are strong, and you are the creator of your experience. And when you find yourself in any state that doesn't feel joyful and loving and exactly how you like your world to be, realize that that is a communication from source saying that this isn't right for you and that you can go, okay, I'm going to answer that that conversation by saying, okay, you're right. This isn't right for me. I am doing this. And when you shift yourself into that way, then you and, and the source, God, consciousness, yada, yada, whatever you call it, are then working in unison for the life of your desires. So, and, and you can do it. I have complete faith in you. Oh, that's a beautiful way to end the show. John, thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. I'm, I, it's always a pleasure, Luis. I just enjoy you so much. Oh, and you just, I can't stop smiling when I'm talking to you. So thank you so much. <laughs> Bye, John. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. If you liked this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate, inspirational interviews.